changing the OGL did not give us as much as it would cost everybody. And so yeah. therefore it's dumb. This was a, a terrible mistake. And the first thing to do when you're in a hole is stop digging. You know, it doesn't feel good, but it's somewhat of a relief to hear D&D's executive producer admit that this whole OGL mess was a terrible mistake. And that's only one tiny piece of my hour-long interview with Kyle Brink, head of the D&D creative team, where I asked him questions from you, the TTRBG community, about licensing for 5e and 6e, which he doesn't like it being called that, licensing for previous editions, the fates of D&D employees who spoke out against these attempted changes, why the heck WotC even tried to change the OGL in the first place, and much more. If you have an hour to listen, the entire discussion is available on my second channel, linked below, which is all about long-form RPG discussion, and you'll notice that on the surface, it sounds mostly like a friendly conversation, because that's just how I talk to people. But this video is my critique of Kyle's answers and my own responses during our conversation. So I want you to listen closely with me and ideally come away with your own conclusions, although I'll share my personal takeaway at the end of this video. Then we can get back to talking about, oh, I don't know, games or something? <laughs> because I'm Bob, this is where we learn how to have more fun playing RPGs together. And this very first question comes from me. Why choose my YouTube channel for one of these few discussions rather than a channel like D&D Shorts with much higher viewership, much more dedicated coverage of the OGL situation. Uh, in particular, we so we wanted a variety, um, but we also went, didn't want to do 65 interviews. So we had to yeah. pick a handful, right? <laughs> the main driver though is people who we felt we could have a conversation with uh, because that's what I wanted this to be. Um, uh, but I, I do want to just follow up and say, like we had our guy Will out there on D&D Shorts who his videos were getting like hundreds of thousands yeah. of views on this. He was very critical. Um, so was he somebody who wasn't asked about this? Uh, I don't know whether he was asked. Um, I personally would have been uncomfortable speaking to him because mm. of the approach he took to it. Um, it really uh, seemed really extreme. Yeah, I, I think Will would agree that his videos are intentionally sensational. Uh, yeah. So so maybe, maybe that's something you wanted to avoid. I, I can understand that. They chose people who they knew they could have an exchange with rather than people who would more bluntly shut them down if their responses sounded like corporate BS. For example, D&D Shorts, who rightfully shut down a ton of corporate BS during this whole OGL debacle. His approach was extreme and sensational because what WotC tried to do was extreme and terrible, as Kyle later admits. So let's talk about why WotC even tried to do this. It's well understood that the attempted deauthorization of OGL 1.A broke decades of goodwill and explicit promises between the D&D brand, or would have broken explicit promises between the D&D brand and TGRPG community. Uh, so if not to collect royalties, which was one of the first terms walked back, and if not to prevent the creation of D&D NFTs, which Hasbro produces for other properties like Power Rangers, if not to protect the D&D brand from pub problematic publications from which it's already protected by precedents for libel, slander, misuse, etc. Uh, and with the entire decision to deauthorize ultimately having been overturned, what was Wizards of the Coast's real goal with the drive to deauthorize OGL 1.0a in the first place? So I'll, I'll say that I'm explaining um, a, a mission that I inherited. Um, I got here a couple years ago and the effort to uh, uh, to change the OGL was underway when I arrived. So what was Wizards looking to accomplish with this? Well, right. there, there were two big things, there were two big concerns. One is, uh, what about a deep-pocketed outside actor coming into D&D and changing the face of D&D? You know, like a multi-billion dollar, you know, conglomerate or media concern to come in and create, for example, a, a virtual reality space where you could play D&D and then that would change the face of what D&D is, how it plays. And the thought was, well, what if you put a royalty rate on there that no deep-pocketed outside actor would ever you know, be willing to take on. Okay, let's put that in there. Well, we don't want to destroy, don't, we don't want to hurt the creators. Yeah. So let's- Hurt the shallow pockets as well. <laughs> yeah, so let's, <laughs> like, so let's like raise the bar so high that it really won't affect anyone. Well, mm. I'm glad he didn't try to double down on the completely phony argument about NFTs, but he still lands on this deep pocketed outside company idea where some huge gaming company would come in and use the OGL to make a virtual reality experience, or he even says, artificial intelligence game masters that they could change the face of D&D. 
but like you, I'm sure, I still wasn't buying this argument for a few important reasons. So was there still a fear that whatever these outside companies would make that could be a virtual reality, something AI, it would be something very different from what D&D is. They wouldn't be able to call it D&D. There was still a fear that it would be too closely associated with D&D, even in that case. Yeah, because you can't, while you can't put D&D on the box, um, yeah. you can say compatible with the fifth edition of, or you mm -hmm. could say this is a game very much like D&D, <clears throat> or this is the closest thing you could have to a D&D experience. But I'm pretty sure you cannot use the trademark term D&D anywhere in or on your OGL product. That's why every other 5e product says 5e rather than D&D. So this wild idea that some huge gaming company would make a virtual reality AI game master experience without being able to use the term D&D, yet people would confuse it for D&D, just felt ridiculous. We went back and forth on this for a bit longer, but it didn't really go anywhere, so let's just get to the next question. Besides releasing the SRD 5.1 under a Creative Commons license, what behaviors and specific actions will D&D and Wizards of the Coast take to rebuild that trust? There's a few things. One is um, further commitment to the SRD. So we'll, the SRD will remain compatible with all our upcoming rules changes. So as we develop one D&D, for example, we're not going to leave uh, creators behind. People will be able to come along just as they are right now with the rest of 5th edition. We want to bring the older editions uh, under the uh, Creative Commons as well. So these actions to continue to show commitment to the open creator community is what we're going to be doing. This was easily a high point of the conversation. Trust me, there are some low points coming soon, but wow, they just put the 5e SRD under Creative Commons, and Kyle says they're committed to maintaining the SRD such that 1D&D will also be available to creators under Creative Commons, and the SRDs from previous earlier editions of D&D will be brought under Creative Commons. When I followed up, he said it's likely that those old SRDs could be ready by the end of this year, and 1D&D will be made available roughly around the launch of the edition in 2024. This is a good move. It's not necessarily a generous move. WotC clearly needed to do this for creators so creators can continue to bolster the D&D brand like they have for the last 20 years. So my main follow-up was this. Okay, I, I would say that's definitely a great step for the creator community, for sure. What about just like the wider, this is touching on another question I have, I think, but wider D&D community, wider gaming community in general, mm. any steps that Wizards might be taking to help rebuild trust? Uh, it's, I mean, it's got to be about what we do. Um, and in terms of the the players, um, one of the things that people will see is that we're not taking options off the table. There's been a lot of concern lately about, hey, with all the um, talk about uh, monetization and the digital play space mm -hmm. and digital this and digital that, are you going to stop making books? Um, the answer is no. Uh, we are going to add more options to the table, and whatever options people want to use, they can use them. And he gave kind of a non-answer. I asked what they're doing for players, and he says that they're going to keep printing books, making digital books, and supporting creators. None of those things are new actions being taken to directly rebuild trust with the wider TTRPG community. We'll touch on this again in a bit, but I did not catch this diversion here during our chat. Instead, I latched onto the 1D&D Creative Commons point because, hey, it was a huge announcement to just drop in this interview, and it brought up a very important question. What, like, how has that perspective changed, I guess, from the people who made that decision if now they're okaying, hey, let's put even more and more and more out in the open where anybody could make an AI uh, you know, virtual reality version of D and D uh, and and destroy us. So it gets back gets back to the uh, the simple math of um, changing the OGL did not give us as much as it would cost everybody, and so yeah. therefore it's dumb, and so therefore we're not doing it. Um, and so okay, when you take that decision off the table, you say of the remaining decisions, what's the best one? We obviously have a strong community. Let's lean on that. Let's say great, empower that, and when we release things into the SRD, we'll make sure that they're not things that already that we would need the copyright or trademark for to protect D&D. And he basically admits that the strong TTRPG community is enough to fight back against big changes to the face of D&D. Clearly, 
even when those changes have come from the deep-pocketed inside company. Before we get to the rest of the interview, I want to tell you about one source of strength in the TTRPG community, our sponsor, Layer Magazine. Layer Magazine is a monthly publication for new and veteran game masters developed by a team of expert game masters. It's packed with drag-and-drop resources like adventures, standalone encounters, puzzles, traps, new monsters, and more, all designed for practical use during your session. Their adventures include full-color digital maps for use on VTTs, with multiple versions to cover the needs of every Game Master. And the Layer Magazine team understands just how powerful player options have become in recent years, so they develop content accordingly for GMs who want to consistently challenge their players in fun ways. So check out the Layer Magazine Patreon through the link below. Alright, my next question for Kyle Brink was about the leaked draft of the OGL that we all know was not really a draft. For the sake of transparency, why, uh, at least as recently as I've seen the latest statements or discussion about it, mm. the initial OGL still being called a draft when it was shared with a small group of publishers with, uh, as I understand it, some kind of binding license to sign it with a turnaround time of about one week. So there's a few things in there. Uh, one is there were dates in there, um, they had, which mm -hmm. implied turnaround times. We were looking for feedback, which is why we were sharing it under NDA with creators to get their feedback on what it contained, including timelines. And so, you know, some yeah. of the very first feedback we got back was, that's not enough time. Okay, mm -hmm. dates changed, right? So we, so. And I'm going to cut it there because we just go back and forth for a few minutes mulling over the exact dates shared with this leaked version of the OGL. And he seems to insist that seeking feedback from a few major third party publishers under NDAs counts as getting feedback from the community. That's the point I tried to press him on. In the first statement that came out, there was a line in here. Our plan was always, you know, so quote, our plan was always to solicit the input of our community before any update to the OGL. So with that phrasing, would you say that line was is really getting at we were asking this small group or was there still some plan that within that week the community would have been asked for feedback? Oh, it was going to be a longer timeline. I mean, that, so the, the dates in the in the leaked document were already obsolete by the time it was out there. But nah, it wasn't going to be a longer timeline until, thankfully, those few publishers under NDAs told WotC those initial dates were a non-starter. There's no way the initial plan always included getting feedback from the actual TTRPG community as a whole. For all his other admissions during our chat, this point felt like a really weird hill to die on, so maybe we were just misunderstanding each other, but the next part was definitely not a good move. Okay, during the TTRPG community's push for a response, after about a week or so of, of silence from D&D and Wizards of the Coast, many people canceled their D&D Beyond subscriptions. Can you tell us exactly how many people came together and unsubscribed from D&D Beyond? Uh, I can't because I don't work on that team. Um, I will say that some people unsubscribed, and I will say that since going to Creative Commons, people have come back. I don't have the, the final numbers. Yes, Kyle 100% does not work on that team. But his answer was straight up corporate BS. And here's why. The influencer team had asked me to send all of my questions before the interview. Note, I did not do that because that would be stupid. But they made a good point, saying, we understand that some questions may require us to source data or in-depth info on specific subject matters. We want to have this information available and at the ready for you beforehand. So I did send them this question about D&D Beyond subscriptions because it required them to source data on a specific subject matter. And that means one of two things. A, Kyle knew the number of lost subscriptions and lied, or B, Kyle didn't know the number because the team wanted him to be willfully ignorant of this number, even though I specifically told them beforehand I was going to ask for that number. But there is a third possibility. Since Hasbro is a publicly traded company, sharing that number could be really bad for business. I totally understand that. And if that's the case, he could have just said, I can't share those numbers because we're part of a publicly traded company. Okay, honesty, done. But instead, they premeditated this decision to either lie or be willfully ignorant. And that is the opposite of transparency. Not a good move for a company that supposedly wants to rebuild trust. But let's go to something that was kind of good. At what point during uh, that week or so when community was kind of waiting on that first response, did the creative team at D&D first realize, 
hey, we like this isn't good. A couple things. Um, the creative team was um, included a little bit, but not enough and too late in the process. Um, and the okay. feedback from the creative team was very much in line with the feedback from the creators and ultimately from the community. This is going to be okay. destructive. This is a bad yeah. idea. Um, uh, a lot of our the, the broken process that we had, and this is my personal responsibility, because I was trying to screen them from this OGL license update process and let them make the books. Um, I didn't mm. have our lead creatives at the table to talk about to talk with the legal team about a document because I didn't feel like it was a good use of anybody's time. Mm. That was a mistake because that would have had more voices at the table next to me pointing out where this was not a great idea. This is nice. Kyle admits it was his call early on to keep the creative team out of the OGL discussion, and he admits that it was a mistake. I agree that it was a fairly sensible mistake, and that's humility, that's accountability, that's transparency. Why can't they act like that all the time? I don't know. Later, he says the creative team will be more involved going forward, which is a great change, and he also admits that the lack of internal communication at WOTC exacerbated the whole problem. The other thing was during that time, there were additional um, uh, people, in, internal people, who were taking information outside. Um, and I, the common word mm. for it is leak, but I, it's actually just sure. people communicating. They don't feel heard, so they got to go someplace else to be heard. That caused internal communication to shut down because people felt like, I don't know who's in this meeting with me. Are they recording this? Is this going to be leaked? Am I going to be the next mm. person demonized on the internet? Okay. This kind of makes sense. Once the leaks or external communications were just pouring out of WOTC, it created this feedback loop where communication shut down to prevent more leaks but that also shut down their ability to quickly work on solutions. The obvious answer, I think, is to do what they've now promised and just be transparent and act in good faith. But uh, we all know how that first statement they managed to get out was pretty ugly. It's fair to say that the entire TTRPG community was a little shocked by the first statement, including such infamous quotes as, they won and so did we. While compiling these questions, I noticed that that first initial post is now gone and redirects to the most recent statement uh, about putting the SRD under Creative Commons. So my question is, would you say that, and a pointed question, I'll admit, hiding that initial statement exemplifies the brand's renewed trust to account or renewed commitment to accountability and building trust? Uh, I uh, I don't know the exact circumstances around the redirect okay. that's being discussed I, that's uh to be honest that, that's, that's totally fair i don't yeah. expect that it's like kyle brinks on there changing <laughs> links around um so we actually had a laugh about this but honestly this was another major low point to sum it up while i was preparing my questions i noticed that clicking on the first terrible dnd beyond statement now redirected to the nice one about creative commons in other words they tried to hide that initial statement and hiding one's mistakes, once again, is the exact opposite of transparency. That thing that they promised to show going forward. Not a good move. Thankfully, however, at my recommendation, they put it back up with a simple disclaimer. Anyway, one of the biggest questions from the community was, what about the ORC license? I know that, at least to date of our talk, nothing's been published of what the ORC license will actually mm. look like, yeah. uh, being developed by Paizo and a bunch of other publishers. Does WOTC have any intention to like read into that and see if there's any room for putting some D&D &D content under that license? I mean, honestly, as soon as people are comfortable having us at the table, we'd love to participate in that conversation. We think it's a great initiative, and I'm curious to see where it goes. I think when things cool down a little bit, I think that'll that'll be... It just would have seemed weird for us to run out right now and say, yeah, we love ORC too, if you'd be like, really? Do sure. you, though? You know, so... Yeah, that that's totally fair. I think anything that you say at this point, many people will go... Do you, though? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I'm sure we'll see it in the comments <laughs> on whatever ends up of this video. Yeah. And as we've seen in this breakdown, it's completely fair to remain skeptical about what Wizards of the Coast says they'll do versus how they'll actually behave, such as breaking renewed promises of transparency within days of making those promises. Still, they do say a bunch of nice things, and I hope that they stay true to this next one. Now that the 5e core rules in a sense, belong to the TTRPG community existing under Creative Commons. Uh, and you might have touched on this. Are there still plans for 6E, aka 1D&D, &D, to be functionally compatible with 5E? Yep, that's the plan. Awesome if true. And it does make sense that if both editions will be under Creative Commons, there's no real incentive to change the game in a way that would make it no longer compatible. 
Then Kyle jumps in calling out the 6E terminology. And I get why people call it 6th edition and so forth. I mean, it's uh, it feels, and I'm not, this is my strategic sure. declaration. This is just my viewpoint as a game guy watching it happen. It feels much more like the evolution that happened in 3rd edition that ultimately got called 3.5. Is that a is that a semi-official statement that 5.5E is a... <laughs> Honestly, is it a better thing to call it than 6E? <laughs> spe speaking in, in my role as executive producer sure. of the game and, and at the strategic table, I don't want another edition ever. I just want right. this edition. And so we'll need to update it, of course, as we learn stuff. And then I want those updates to get ported into the SRD so that SRD stuff stays compatible. So yes to compatibility. So he didn't really agree that calling it 5.5E is any better, but rather that 5E is just being updated and will continue to be updated over time. The thing is, this means the 2024 print books could easily become obsolete after just another few years of updates pushing people to go digital if they want to stay with the most current version of the game. Speaking of updates and changes, another highly requested question was, who started this mess? Thinking about the initial changes that were decided upon, again, talks that, hap that started happening before you were present, yeah. um, do you think those conversations initiated somewhere within Hasbro, within Wizards of the Coast, within D&D, like the D&D team, or some combination of those groups? Um, so it was a few things. So as I mentioned earlier, we had those big goals, and then chasing those goals, we ran down some terrible forks in the path. As you can see, Kyle diverts a little bit here, going back to what decisions were made, rather than answering my question of where those decisions got started. So I tried to get us back on track. The The question is really just along the lines of what, like this idea of, hey, the OGL needs to be changed. Where did that originate? If, yeah. if you can share that. Yeah, well, so it was it was already underway when I arrived. So I don't really know like a, a name who started that ball rolling. The ball was rolling when I walked in and, and continued it rolling. But I can certainly see, for example, um, someone whose interest is in protecting our IP, thinking that mm -hmm. the OGL was a bad idea. And he dodges it again, saying he doesn't know a specific person, and then just repeating the justifications for changing it. But I didn't ask for a specific person or about the justifications, just which company started it. I'll say that at some point in our discussion, or honestly, it could have been in one of the other interviews I watched because now it's all becoming a blur, but somewhere, Kyle said that these OGL changes were almost certainly not a Hasbro initiative because at the time that these decisions were starting up, D&D was still barely on Hasbro's radar, meaning it either was a Wizard of the Coast or D&D team decision, and that's probably why he didn't want to give a straight answer. Anyway, I completely got swept up in his diversion, and I think you will too, because this was my favorite thing he said during our entire conversation. My viewpoint, and this is... I've been voicing this very strongly and it's been accepted at the executive level is the way we participate in this is as another creator of a different scale, obviously. Mm -hmm. But uh, so rather than pursue like an anti-competitive strategy of, hey, let's make it harder for others, we should focus on making good stuff because the better stuff yeah. we make, the better we'll do. And that's how this should work. And I say that's an excellent position. Yeah. That echoes a, sent a sentiment that I heard from uh, a creator that I follow, Sly Flourish, who is saying that rather than even using a term like third party now, he kind of wants to talk about, and I agree with this, uh, publishers as, you know, 5e producers or like just 5e publishers instead of mm. third party, party publishers. And Wizards of the Coast slash D&D is one of those 5e publishers right now. With 5e and now 5.5e becoming available under Creative Commons, there's really no such thing as official versus third party anymore because the game belongs to everyone. I completely agree that the community will be even stronger if we all judge and support these publishers based on the quality of materials they produce rather than their logo. Of course, the bigger your company, the better your product should be, but even Kyle Brink seems to agree that WotC has to step up their game and produce the best products out there if they want to stay on top. One way to do that is to make sure your employees are happy and we also heard that things got kind of hostile inside WotC during this mess. There were rumors of employees who communicated those things, either being fired or quitting. Can you confirm whether or not any of that happened? Uh, like not the leaks, but whether or not people left their jobs or were forced to leave their jobs because of their opinions on this? 
Uh, not on the tabletop team, which is what I'm closest to and could speak to. That okay. I, th no, no, no departures there have been related to the OGL one way or the other. Uh, I can't speak to what may have happened on D&D Beyond because that's not my team. And so okay. people who leave for any reason there, nobody tells me why. I just find okay. out somebody has quit or has left for whatever reason. Um, I didn't ask about a breakdown of who left which teams or anything. So Kyle suddenly jumping to say he doesn't know why people left the D&D Beyond team is suspicious. My guess is that this was Kyle's attempt to nip the bud of any potential discussion about some specific leaks, which said Chris K.O. on the digital side of things is allegedly a horrible boss who yells at people and ultimately caused a number of folks to quit because of his behavior. But back to my actual question, would they still be in danger of saying, of telling you, go walk in your office one day, hey Kyle, I'm one of the people who leaked some information would that be a problem for them to, to like come clean about that now? Well, um, there's so we all agree as employees to certain things. And one of the things we agree to do is to not disclose confidential information. Now, it mm. matters a lot if somebody comes in and tells me. And it, I take that strongly into account. And I would okay. be much more inclined towards a recovery program with a person like that than an exit program. Because yeah. I, they're showing integrity by coming in and telling me. I like hearing that he personally would value someone coming forward and being transparent about the situation, but we've also seen how the company as a whole has already broken their renewed promises of transparency. Let's just get back to some straightforward questions. Will physical books for the next edition, as far as you're aware, include any kind of discount or uh, perhaps free digital version of those books? We very much want to do that. So you've seen some physical digital bundles available on D&D Beyond already where you can buy for basically the, the cover price of the book. You get the book and the digital as well uh, through our own uh, storefront there. Uh, and then in addition, we want the local game store, though, to be supported. This is also nice to hear, but we'll have to wait and see if they actually do anything to help local game stores. Speaking of digital books, what other new products are being developed in order to meet the company goal of further monetizing the D&D brand? So uh, the way I view um, monetizing is making stuff that people want to buy. I mean, and so in order to do that, we have to make more products. And uh, the main area that we're looking at right now is what can we make for players? Very straightforward question, right? Well, he dances around it for a bit by defining monetization and then basically lands on digital books, which they already make. Yeah. But in addition to the digital books, like we saw glimpses of these really cool uh, minis on it with the Unreal Engine mm -hmm. in the announcement about One D and D. Yeah. So things like that are in the works that will be like for purchase for character for players. Yeah. So what we're going to have is uh, so the digital play spaces, which you saw the three D there for as, yeah. as one of the ways you can play. And the idea there is you've got enough stuff there to play, and then there will also be extra things if you want to buy. You know, hey, you know what, I can. I can represent this ogre with an upscaled orc figure, but I'd really like to have the ogre figure. Okay, I'll go buy the ogre okay. figure for, you know, whatever it is. Similar to like when you buy actual plastic figures, right? There's some that you have and you substitute if that's, you know, you proxy yeah, for absolutely. the giant spider with the wolf because <laughs> that's what you need for this fight. But hey, maybe you pick up a spider next time you're in the store. Same kind of thing, but just digitally. That, that's a great analogy of like substituting stuff you have at home. I don't know. I'm speaking off the cuff here. I feel like there is a stigma against the addition of many of these digital miniatures and things because there's already a very a very negative association with what would people would say like digital skins and stuff like that mm -hmm. for other online games yeah and i think a lot of the yeah. way that has been done in video games um since a big chunk of my history sure. is in video yeah, games yeah. is through like loot boxes and randomization and basically right. the gambling aspect to it and we're yeah, not which doing is not that. a this is just gonna okay. be a straight for purchase i want that thing it's 50 cents i'll take the thing so in the context of this particular hobby, those digital microtransactions are almost the same thing as the physical microtransactions people are already used to making for physical miniatures. Let me know what you think about this in the comments though, while we go over some other quick questions. Is there any intention for 1D&D upon its release to be published in multiple languages? So more of an international release. The answer is yes, with an asterisk. And the asterisk is uh, localization takes time. And it, yeah. the localization timelines are directly related to the amount of content. And this is a lot of content. Um, mm -hmm. So I can't commit to day and date, but I can certainly commit to as fast as humanly possible once we finish the books. Is there a plan for 
like our three core books, PHB, Monster Manual, and DMG, to come out at the same time? Or will they be kind of spaced out like the 5e books were published? We're figuring that out still. That's that's another train cars problem. Um, because normally okay. we only publish one book at a time, and our system is yeah. sort of set up to have like a cascade of book after book after book. And so like trying to, right. for that one year, line up three big books to hit at the same time is, yeah. that's a lot. The um, box set style. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, there will be a box set for it. Um, I can't I just can't say today that that's how it'll release. Any potential, and I feel like I expect I know the answer to this, any potential that we would see a revision or, or republishing of the Dark Sun setting. Uh, I'll be I'll be frank here. The Dark Sun setting is problematic I in agree. a lot yeah. of ways. Um, and yeah. that's the main reason we haven't come back to it. We know it's got a huge yeah. fan following. So. Yeah, that's totally fair point. And I think that's already yeah. kind of the consensus. People, I think, just wanted to hear yeah. uh, somebody say, is D&D Beyond going to be the bookstore and then the VTT will be elsewhere? And, and how will they work together? So at the at the back end, we expect everybody to be treated as a singular customer. So no matter where you, you know, if you buy the book on D&D Beyond, you should have it in the play space. If you buy it in the play space, you should have it on D&D Beyond. But there might right. be two different apps you will launch depending on what experience you want. Do I want the D&D Beyond experience or do I want the play, the play space experience? Artificer coming to the SRD. Mm. Is that, a, is that a thing that is in the works? It's certainly something that was in the works, certainly something we've been considering. Okay. Um, and uh, I can't commit to it today, but we were ready to do yeah. it once, which suggests we'd be ready to do it again. Okay. Uh, and then last question. Looking back on how the entire OGL situation has transpired, would you say that anyone, as in the decision makers who attempted uh, these OGL changes or the community faced... Uh, with the facts of, of these attempted changes, would you say that either of these parties won? That's not how I think about it. Um, I think about it as we got to good. a good place on a <laughs> by traveling a really painful road. Um, yeah. So everybody went through a bunch of pain and we got to a place that would have been great to start from. Um, well, here we are. So I'm glad we're here and it sucks that we took that road to get here. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Now, here's my overall personal takeaway, and it should sound familiar. I'm going to support the publishers and play the games that allow me and my players to have the most fun at our table. I love the game of 5e, and I'm gonna keep using the 5e books I have and talking about it here, but I'm only gonna buy any new WotC book if the book seems undeniably fun. For example, I think the D&D movie is gonna be really fun, so I'm gonna see it. But if you cannot have fun with D&D anymore, totally fine. I support that. If you still love D&D and think every new WotC book is the most fun book yet, I support that too. My only recommendation for you is to learn and play more games. I guarantee you that another RPG, probably 10 other RPGs, have already done the exact things that you're looking for in D&D or whatever system you've been playing 95% of the time. It's easy to learn other systems, and it's easier than you think to get your group on board for a one-shot. Hey guys, I want to run a one-shot of this other game for our next session. That's literally all there is to it. And if you don't already, just have fun tinkering around with homebrew mechanics yourself and maybe building your own world. In fact, check out this video about a super easy method from Gary Gygax himself about how to make your own RPG world, then consider subscribing to support the channel. Thank you for your questions and your support during this whole stupid mess, and keep building.